And what a lovely morning. Good morning. Good morning. We've talked the whole night through. Good morning. Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to stay up late. Good morning. Good morning to you. When the band began to play, the stars were shining bright. Now the milkman's on his way, it's too late to say good night. So good morning, good morning, sunbeams will soon smile through. Good morning, good morning to you and you and you and you. Good morning, good morning. We've gapped the whole night through. Good morning, good morning to you. Good morning, Melody. Good morning, good morning to the listeners and... Um, I guess everyone is uh, awaiting the big speech this evening. Are you going to watch it? Bet. Watch it, and and I'm going to take notes. And that usually lasts about three or four pages, and then I throw the pen down and quit. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. um, So uh, we'll see how that. I don't think anybody's really expecting any surprises or anything. So I don't think so, unless he reads the memo. Unless he reads the memo out loud. I think that'd be just hysterical, but you know, no, yeah, that's I have not going to happen. Session. Oh, come on, mom! <laughs> but one thing, <laughs> but one thing I do want to say this morning: we have a, a da- the Dow was dropping 300 points as the <laughs> as the sell off. Uh, we had, we were down triple digit triple digits yesterday, and uh, I'm just picking this up now because we were busy trying to connect to the show. Um, there was a unilateral move on uh, stocks and um, um, the S&P and the Dow posted their worst sessions of the year yesterday. Uh, the Treasury yields climbed even further today. Yesterday they closed at 2.70 and it was near levels not seen since 2014. And, uh, of course, they're going to blame inflation. The, the whine, oh, we don't have inflation. We don't understand what's going on. And then they get a little, <laughs> oh, no, I'm so scared to death we have inflation. Now we got to, <laughs> I mean, it's just like, are you kidding me? I mean, it's just so <laughs> ridiculous. No play. No play. But Dow Jones, is, you know, they dropped 300 points uh, with United wow. Health as the biggest decliner. And the S&P pulled back almost 1%, again, with healthcare as the worst performing sector. The NASDAQ composite fell 1% this morning. And um, so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the Dow dropped 177 points yesterday. Uh, let's see if there's any interesting news right now. And, of course, the big concern is, you know, they no longer uh, will have easy monetary policy that we've had since the Great Recession. And... Um, you know, we'll see if the, the Federal Reserve's uh, uh, will do anything. Again, what's interesting is that the Federal Reserve chairman gets replaced on Saturday. Um, so uh, Jerome Powell will be taking the place of Janet Yellen. And um, so I don't know if this is a move up. Um, I was going to ask you, what do you think of that? Is that going to be a positive or, or is there any positive anyway? <laughs> Well, the thing of it is they can't do anything anyway. They're between a rock and a hard place. So, you know, they can, you know, if they continue to raise rates, uh, I mean, the 10-year yield is what, uh, um, you know, so many of your debt is based on, so much of your debt is based on. So people say, oh, well, you know, the Federal Reserve only raises at a quarter point. What's the big deal? Well, you know what? It is a big deal because it sets up a trend. It sets up a trend and you have the impact on people. Um, on their consumer spending, on their disposable incomes. Um, So, you know, it does make a difference. And I think this is, uh, you know, mortgage rates have jumped to the highest point in four years. People saying, well, you know, anything below 5% is is, uh, still low. I mean, it it wasn't that long ago that we were paying 7 8%. Yeah, well, you know, just like anything else in this world of finance, it has become accustomed to these low rates. Everything is based on easy money, mm-hmm. cheap money. And when you start adjusting that equation, is our economy truly strong enough? Is there enough disposable income out there or, or wages high enough to to accept, you know, when your money is going to cost more? No, it, it isn't. And that's the problem. Um, not when you've had world economies all based on on, on stimulus 
and you know people oh we got the tax reform and we're going to start having that trickle down and there's going to be a lot of talk of infrastructure spending and so forth and and uh you know and, and again i agreed you know i think we're at the point of collapse i think that is why they did the tax reform i believe this is why we have the heavy pushes on this uh infrastructure spending bill and everything um because they need it it isn't uh you know what are they going to use when we really get into a recession they're not going to have anything to pull us out i mean they're using up um uh, you know they pulled the last thing out of their hat and uh, so, um, you know, the illusion continues, and you know, we're in very dangerous times, and yet people just, uh, hey, the stock markets are making record highs. We're positive. Consumer confidence is, again, stronger than, you know, it ever has been. Uh, consumer confidence numbers are slated to be released. Uh, they probably were. Uh, they were supposed to be released at 10 o'clock. Let me see if I can find them real quick. Uh, Home, we have home prices are surging to new highs. I mean, who can afford those? I mean, I was mm. thinking, you know, you can't even buy a house anymore for a quarter of a million dollars. And I'm thinking to myself, does anybody have any rational ideas of just how much a quarter of a million dollars is for most you know, people? That used to be a mansion. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when my parents were young, I remember them talking about their dream house of four, $40,000 home. A forty thousand dollar home was their dream house, and they never got it. <laughs> that was their dream house, and I thought, you know, now that would be nothing, nothing. Exactly, and you know, and and people bank on their homes price mm. rise, but really, a home is a depreciating asset, you know, because you know, even how much it, you know, over the period of time. I mean, you're repairing, you're replacing, you're updating. And uh, so you're, you're putting – most people put a lot of money into their homes, whether they realize it or not. And uh, uh, they might not do it all at once, but over a period of time. So you really – It is an investment. There's no doubt about it. it it's a depreciating. Mm -hmm. It's a depreciating asset. And uh, you can't bank on your home, you know, buying those thirty, forty thousand dollar $40,000 homes and having them go to a quarter million dollars. Um, like we've seen in the past. And again, it's, you know, are, ho are homes really rising to that level or is it the, because the dollar is losing its value? It's probably a little bit of both. Certainly have seen uh, inventory of homes. And, and again, people are upside down in their homes. So if you wanted to sell your home today, you're going to have to buy at a higher rate most likely. So are you going to be able to, even if you're just looking to upgrade a little bit, or maybe if you're even looking to downsize, uh, you're going to be paying a higher rate of interest. And uh, will people be able to afford that? Um, it will play out. I don't think they will. And I think the housing market is doomed. And we're going to see a lot of the, the problems uh, um, that we have had before. Because they never solved the problems. So how can the problems go away if they never solve the problems? They just mm -hmm. put a Band-Aid over them. And uh, there's an interesting article. And a Band-Aid on a tourniquet doesn't really help. No, it doesn't. You need, well, I mean, on when you need a tourniquet. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you, you're, exactly, exactly. I came across this article yesterday. I can't remember if we mentioned it or not, but Alaska. I love Alaska. It's, a mm -hmm. be it's beautiful. And the people are wonderful. People are wonderful everywhere, but but they're turning. They have to turn to government for food and health care mm. amid recession. Well, when was the last time anybody heard about Alaska being in a recession? Tens of thousands of people are turning to the government for health care and food among Alaska's recession, prompting questions from state lawmakers about the sustainability of those safety net programs. Governor Bill Walker's administration projects 240,000 people to be enrolled in the Medicaid health care program up from 163,000 in 2015. Um, Medicaid, supported by both and state federal governments, is one of the biggest line items in Alaska's budget at about $700 million. Um, the total program covers nearly one-third of the state's population. If you're a citizen of, uh, uh, if you're a resident, not a citizen, if you're a resident of Alaska, you do get a, a monthly check based on uh, the oil 
that they uh, use. Yes. Now, we, we do know oil prices have dropped considerably, so they would be highly impacted. Um, they, people wouldn't get as much as they normally would when, you know, we saw oil trading down around the, you know, $25, $30 level. Now that it's up 60 plus, it should help Alaska out a little bit more. And, but I thought the headline was interesting. Uh, uh, no one talks about the problems Alaska is having. And, um, you know, the Arctic goes deeper into, you know, how they're managing and so forth. And, and, I mean, most of your Alaskan people are hunters and fishermen and so forth. So that's why, again, I find it difficult how, that they have to turn to government for food. It's just... just it, it's uh, amazing, isn't it? That's, that's, not, that's not what we call freedom and independence. We are going into a break. Your calls are welcome today at 717-300-1218. That's 717-300-1218. Melody and Beth stand with Power Talk. We'll be right back. Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Years ahead of the dominant media, FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. And we have returned to listening to Power Talks with Melody and Beth Ann in the morning. And Melody, was she's got some really good stuff this morning. I'm just sitting back here and I'm just drinking it all up. Drinking it all up. Go hit, hit the road there. I mean... That's not well, the right word, but <laughs> thanks. Hit the road, running. Jack, and don't you running. come back. No, 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 no more, no more, no more. We are, more. We the, are the singing talk show host. Back. No <laughs> <more>. <laughs> <laughs> <That's what we laughs> uh, anyway, I'm alto. Right. <laughs> I'm alto. I'm a soprano. So You're an okay. 
Obviously yep. you are. <laughs> <laughs> to go in the studio. Todd, are you listening? We're coming in the studio, and we're going to cut some music. <laughs> He's rolling his eyes around. I can see it now. Yeah, All right. <laughs> but um, what's interesting is the, uh, you know, everybody was talking about the surge in oil prices that we have seen, and this was out of the Telegraph, and it just confirms everything that we talk about, especially on the Financial Survival Program and on this show, that how the oil price could derail global economy. Higher oil prices could knock the global economic resurgence off course uh, as the price has jumped by more than uh, 50 basis points since its most recent low uh, or percent since its most recent low point in June of 2017. It's hard to believe that wasn't even a year ago. Um, so both J.P. Morgan Barclays have um, raised their forecast for the oil price over the next year. Uh, Morgan Stanley analysts warn it poses upside risk to inflation forecasts. And I want to ask all the ladies and gentlemen that are listening to the program and you, Beth, what does that mean for gold and silver? <laughs> It means it's good. <laughs> higher prices for gold and silver also. So you're, we are going to see higher energy costs. We're going to see f uh, higher fuel costs, and uh, it's going to feed through into goods and services. And inflation, you know, they think they can control it. Inflation never went away. It, 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 they just keep saying it. You know, if you say it's a duck, it quacks like a duck. I guess it's a duck or something along those lines but uh, mm -hmm. you know they make people believe we didn't have inflation and it's just um in our goods and services our needs um uh, yes prices are going higher and higher so we could see a, a big break on business and household spending and of course that means uh, you know even the tax cuts and everything else how is it going to help our economy and there was one more interesting article I saw this morning. I'm not sure I can pull it up quick, but it has to do with health care, and it has to do with, uh, uh, now the Dow is dropping 350 points uh, mm -hmm. as the sell-off intensifies. Go, baby, go. And uh, told you folks, get out. I'm mm -hmm. not a financial planner, but get out. So you don't have to worry about these days. Um, let me see if I can find this article. But it was about Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, J.P. Morgan are looking to form a new health care company. These three corporate giants are teaming up to combat what Warren Buffett calls a hungry tapeworm feasting on the U.S. economy, healthcare. Mm. So you have Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, J.P. Morgan, said they plan to collaborate on a way to offer healthcare services to their U.S. employees more transparently and at a lower cost. The three companies plan to set up a new independent company that is free from profit-making incentives and constraints, and this is according to a short statement today. The move sent shares, of course, we see now health care stocks falling, and it's just amazing. You have these three wealthy guys that come out and say, well, you know, maybe we'll, <laughs> and it impacts the health care market, you know, to where the, all the uh, health care stocks are falling. Mm. It, it's amazing what words that's that's it just goes to show you that there's nothing but hot air uh, based on uh, <laughs> under the stop my beautiful my beautiful balloon <laughs> my beautiful balloon the, the hot air is getting cold hard as it might be reducing health care burdens on the economy while improving outcome for employees and their families would be worth the effort and that's from Bezos he said in a statement success is going to require talented experts a beginner's mind and a long term orientation I was telling Beth during the break they might be on to something to supply to their employees um, my doctor was hired uh, by Tyson to become a company doctor because they thought, and it was mainly to improve their workers' comp uh, and their health care because, you know, people get 
injured on the job and so forth. And so instead of going to the doctor, instead of going through all the rigmarole and the various uh, um, time off, uh, wages, lost uh, uh, hours and so forth for both the company and the employee, they would send them to their in-house doctor. And it was a successful program. They saw uh, less people um, needing time off. Uh, they saw so both the company and the employee were not impacted. Um, they saw injuries actually improve faster because they were having more of a direct connect and quicker access um, to their injuries. So it was a successful program for Tyson, and he was my doctor was just there. It was like a two year trial period that they were wanted to see how it would impact and you can call it a you know the company store or whatever, but uh perhaps this is the way that uh maybe these corporations will face health care uh in the future uh mm-hmm. maybe they will create their own um inside health care systems. Uh, I don't know if that's good or bad <laughs> at this point. Well, you know, it is a it's a competition thing, isn't it? And so, if they do that, it could be good, and it could be more controlling. <laughs> it's just you know, insurance is controlling anyway. You know, you pay them, and then they tell you what you can and cannot have done, or how much it's going to cost, or whatever. You know, and uh, but it's and, interesting. And, 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 you know, but, and a lot of the people are at fault for for that. I mean, because they go because they have a little hangnail, they go to the doctor. Oh and, my gosh! Yes. You know, so you know the, the people became a part of that problem um, because they didn't have to worry about cost anymore. They didn't have to dish out, you know, the office visit anymore. They had a copay of ten dollars. So they went for anything. They went and for anything. And you're absolutely correct. And you know, they've talked about some of these uh, these. Uh, Things that are happening with uh, um, with the influenza, with the flu, and the, and they want everybody to take the flu shots, and and they talk about the children at risk, and they are. I mean, I'm not saying that they're not. I'm not downplaying that. Um, but kids seem to uh, they've gone through this era in medicine where they give a child an antibiotic for absolutely nothing. I mean. They'll they'll just throw them on an antibiotic for a hangnail, <laughs> mm-hmm. for an infection, rather than to to meet that infection head on, do a little surgery. You know, parents don't want to they don't want to hurt the kids. You know, well, it's going to cause pain. Well, you got to do it. You've got to do it. I said otherwise you're going to end up with this. You know, and I, and I had that happen in with one of my kids. Um, and he had a horrible infection, and I had to wrestle him down and and lance it. Uh, I didn't rush him to the doctor because I, I didn't want to cause him pain. <laughs> I didn't want to cause him pain, but I knew how serious this infection was getting that he had been hiding from Mama, and uh, and so I did lance it, and uh, and it got better immediately. I mean, it just immediately it was uh, on its way to healing. One of them came to me about one of theirs, which was the grandchild. And they said, what would you do, Mom? I said, I'd do a little surgery on it. Oh, I just can't do that. I said, so you want me to do it? <laughs> <laughs> but they did. They ended up taking taking the child to the doctor for a, And it was an ingrown toenail. or it wasn't even really an ingrown toenail. It was a hangnail that the child had messed with and got it infected. And they put him on an antibiotic. Instead of dealing with the infection and the problem where it was, they stick them on an antibiotic. My, the, you know, it's too late to make a long story short, but the short of it is they put them on antibiotics for too many things. Yes. And then when they really need it, they wonder why it doesn't work or react or why their body reacts differently to it or why these antibiotics, these bugs are becoming immune to the antibiotics. And that's the reason. And sometimes I want you know we're told, and I agree with it. We we do come, become immune with the the all the antibiotics that are given to us and stuff. Plus, you know, my but sometimes I wonder, doctors, they give you the least amount of of power, and then you have to go back two or three times because it doesn't go away. And I tell them, look, don't give me something wimpy. <laughs> when I first go, if I'm coming to you for something, don't give me something wimpy that I have to come back two or three times because the first one didn't work. 
Give me something that's going to knock, you know, give me what you would give me the third time that I'd be coming back because the other two didn't work. And, you know, some of that, not all of it, but some of that is coming from the insurance companies. When yes, I worked in, I true. worked in the medical clinic and, and at that time was when the HMOs and the PPOs all blessed us from Hillary Clinton. When those came to be, and you had those $10 co-pays, and the doctor got paid X amount of dollars for every every patient he had signed up, whether they saw him or not. But when you come in there, okay, say you're a woman that is plagued with uh, a certain, um, I'm going to say urinary tract infection. Some people are just more apt to get those. He knows you, and he knows that this first thing ain't going to work, and he needs to jump to the uh, more powerful <laughs> uh, fight with it. And But the Insurance companies won't let him. He has to start at the bottom and work back up to the top, and you're going to have to come in there X amount of times before you get it taken care of. And so the power, the control was taken out of your hands, and it was taken out of your doctor's hands. And the insurance company is calling the shots. So every time you come in, there was another $10 copay. Every time you come in, there was a little bit more. Pharmaceuticals got a little bit more because you took that lesser medicine. Now you got to take a bigger medicine. Now you got to do this. And... It's all about money. Follow the money. It's and it's all, all about, about control. When they say, uh, what, what do they call it, managed health care, it's managing your money. Yeah. Not your, not your health. You're absolutely Get real. Correct. Get it's real. It's absolutely correct. It's so, it just irritates me to know. It does <laughs> me too, especially, especially when I was working in the clinic when all of that hit. And I was uh, the head receptionist, meaning I was the one out front. And... Uh, you know, so I had to deal with a lot of angry people and, and find out who they needed to talk to. And, you know, some of them were elderly. They didn't understand. What do you mean I can't see this, doctor? What do you mean I can't have my blood drawn right here? This is where I've come all my life. Well, but your insurance says you can't come here anymore. Or your insurance says you have to go to this lab for your blood work. You can't use our in-house lab anymore. You know, and uh, it, it was so it was out of your control. You no longer had control in that respect of your health care, of your health. And uh, it was in the hands of somebody wearing a suit in an office somewhere far, far away from where you and your doctor existed. So this might be a good thing. We're not quite sure. You know, it was... Uh, <laughs> now that we chased all those rabbits. <laughs> now we chased. But you know what it is. I mean, it's... Uh, uh, this isn't the first time that you had big companies that have teamed up to, to tackle the health care costs. I just mentioned uh, Tyson. You have International Business Machine Corps, IBM. You have uh, American Express. Uh, they were among the founding members of the uh, Health Transformation Alliance, which now includes about 40 big companies that want to transform health care. The group ultimately partnered with existing industry players, including CVS and United Healthcare. Well, that's the problem. You know, they create this, <laughs> they're good intentions, but they end up partnering with CVS and United Health. And of course, it, again, it doesn't benefit, uh, you know, they're going in there telling you, the people, their employees, that we're here to help. They've used the government's line, we're here to help. And they end up, uh, they see the billions of dollars that's available mm -hmm. um, that they can make mm -hmm. uh, providing the health care. Why, why should it go to government? Why should all that billions of dollars go to government? So why don't we create our own health care link and, uh, um, and we'll get some of those billions of dollars. So, <laughs> well, you some, know, of those, uh, some of those companies were some of them that kind of got took down the road anyway. <laughs> So they're going to fight back. Maybe that's the maybe the, the maybe. irony, the irony yeah. in it all. <laughs> I know, and and it's like well, any you know, it's never going to change. No, the key, no. Thing, is, the key thing is being aware of, of of the problems and being aware of 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 the real issues and and the real motivation. And you have to listen to what they say when you read those. You have to listen, read between the lines. You just have to kind of. Uh, um, feel it out, so to speak. You know, going back to what we're going to be doing tonight, listening to the State of the Union address, I remembered back in 2012 when I was listening and I was taking notes to the State of the Union address with President Barack Obama. And he made a comment in the middle of that um, 
uh, speech. And if you can see what's happened since that time and what we're dealing with now with the corruption and the bureaucracy. But what he said was he wanted the power to consolidate the bureaucracy. And I think he did. So much more power is in the president's hands, and I'm not talking about President Trump. I'm just talking about the position than was ever intended to be. And if we want to look at what the problems are, whether it's health care, whether it's taxes, whether it's debt, regardless of what it is, you have to look at Congress. Congress is the one responsible. Yes, we've had bad presidents. We've had mediocre presidents. We've had good presidents. We have presidents of all kinds. But the Congress is the one who stays. We've got term limits on the president. But the Congress stays. And so when you listen tonight, if you, if you guys are going to do that, pay attention to what is said. I know it's President Donald Trump, and we want to trust him a lot more than we trusted President Barack Obama, but you need to listen to what is said. Now, what he's planning to do, I think, is build everything up and, and talk about the accomplishments that have been made in the last year. And he has done a whole lot in the last year. It remains to be seen whether it all will be positive or not. It's positive immediately, and yet it's not. The Dow dropped three triple digits yesterday. Um, you know, things, they're just not as stable as they seem to be, and it's uh, not the fault of President Donald Trump. It's the fault of, of our currency and of the debt. I've learned that much from Melody. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> I've learned a little more, but we can't go into all of that. <laughs> well, you know, I I think Trump's claim to fame is going to be, in my view, is truly his appointments of conservative judges that he's working on that gets absolutely very little press. And it, it always surprises me that even his mouthpieces – don't talk and, and about that. So I don't know if there's because to me what that this to? is years and years and years of you know impacts mm -hmm. on the on this country. And um, so I don't know. I just uh, well, it says the key issues tonight. Uh, this is coming from the Daily Signal, which is part of the Heritage Foundation, and Fred Lucas wrote this. He says the five key points tonight will be the speech will focus on seeking to reach an immigration deal in Congress, the strong economy from his first year in office, pushing a $1 trillion infrastructure, fair and reciprocal trade with other nations, and rebuilding the military. The senior administration officials told reporters Friday that that's what he's going to be. That's what they're briefing everyone on. That's what they say he's going to be speaking about tonight. And, those, you know, he's, he's going to try and, and pull these parties together. I don't think it's going to work, but he's going to try and pull the parties together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they hate him so much that it's not going to happen. And I have to say... Pelosi went, I don't know, ballistic Pelosi. I call her plastic Pelosi. She just went nuts. At Chris Cuomo, almost felt sorry for the man. I almost felt sorry for the man. But she tells him, she, he's asking her about this, uh, this memo that's going to be released if the president signs off on it. And I think he will. Um, the memo that's going to be released. And he's asking her questions. And she's just going ballistic on this thing. The American people don't need to see this. It's, it's not what everybody says, and it's just a, you know, it's a terrible thing for our democracy. And she goes on and on and on, which everything she's saying is the opposite of the Constitution. But he's asking her legitimate questions. I'll give him that. And she, I mean, she lets into him, let's just say this with all due respect, you really don't know what you're talking about right now. <laughs> she and just, usual, the look on his face was priceless and I'm thinking Chris do you get it you sit here and you support them you defend them regardless of what 
And they have absolutely no respect whatsoever for you because you are a pawn that they use day in and day out. And uh, the look on his face I thought was priceless. Almost <laughs> felt sorry for him. Almost felt sorry for him. Not quite. <laughs> But it's true. They're using the, this mainstream media. I know these guys, but they're using them, and they think they're going to get somewhere. And that she was right at him. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, she really need. I mean, she. Uh, I think she's failing, and she's failing quick. You know. But uh, anyway, it's uh, she's a piece of work. That's for she's sure. a piece of work, man. She's a piece of work. And it just amazes amazes me how these p- people like that continue to get elected. elected. I, it, I it's, know. <laughs> you know, um, I had this yesterday, and I really didn't quite get it because I was reading it so quickly. This is also from the Daily Signal. And this just tells where some of the American people are today. We are so mixed up. I, I like to quote an old Berenstein Bears book that I read to my kids, Inside, Outside, Upside, Down. I think that's where we're at. People don't know who they are. They don't know what they are. They don't know what we're supposed to be as a nation. They are totally confused. Well, the Thomas Jefferson Center for the Protection of Free Expression, it's located in Charlottesville, South Carolina, and it's dedicated to the defense of free expression in all its forms, but it gives out annual awards called the Jefferson Muzzles. And this is somebody that has special, has been especially egregious to the ridiculous affronts of free expression. So the, <laughs> this award goes to uh, Patrick Hogan. He's the executive vice president and chief operator of the University of Virginia, which is, you know, founded by Thomas Jefferson. Well, on the 19th of January, Hogan sent out a community advisory in an email to all the students, faculty, and staff, warning them that the university was aware of reports of solicitations by national organizations to encourage the distribution of offensive flyers and memes at colleges and universities across the country during the upcoming weekend, okay? He goes on to tell them, apparently in his mind, this is offensive if somebody has a different opinion of him, and it's a heinous criminal act. So how do they know that he thinks it's a heinous criminal act? Because in his email, he tells students, are you sitting down? He tells students to call 911 if they see someone posting offensive flyers or other material. (laughs) Call 911. Good grief. Call 911. So he, he's getting the Jefferson Muzzles Award. And I'm thinking, he's an idiot. Why do they keep him on staff? The, and it goes into this article that maybe he needs to take some of the classes there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hear music. We're headed into a break. Your calls are welcome at 717-300-1218. I think that's the first time I gave the number out. 717-300-1218. You're listening to Power Talk with Melody and Beth Dan, and we will be right back. Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. 
The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. You're listening to Power Talks with Melody and Beth Ann in the morning. And the number to call, and we are in the final segment of today's show. The number to call is 717-300-1218. That's 717-300-1218. I don't know. Do you have something else? Because I have a little something I want to mention. Well, I do want to say, um, you know, we got some great prices with gold and silver. Uh, we were running the Mint State 62 $20 gold pieces at the same price as bullion coins, American Gold Eagle bullion coins. Um, it's a tremendous buy. You know, when stock markets are hitting record highs, you're, you're going to see, you know, little interest in gold. And, uh, you know, when the $20 gold pieces, um, you'll that will be reflected in their premiums. Uh, and these premiums have never been this low. I got a message from one of my buyers this morning, and they had Mint State 61s on special. And he says, and the memo started out as, I can't even believe I'm sending you this. Uh, because being in the gold business, we understand the importance of, we understand how the industry has grown and we understand how little products out there and we understand that when it hits the fan, um, you're going to have a rush of people in the markets and the product isn't going to be there. And when you're buying $20 gold pieces, if you can get it for the same price as bullion, you should be buying $20 gold pieces all day long. They provide you privacy, they provide you a, a performance, and they provide you protection against confiscation. And I don't use confiscation as a way to sell something, but it's just an added benefit when you're buying the $20 gold pieces. Um, so if, if all you have is bullion and you want to convert them to $20 gold pieces, it's a great time to be doing that uh, because the premiums are so low. And uh, But if you're just stuck on gold bullion, I haven't seen premiums this low in – for bullion in probably 20 years. I mean, incredible buys out there for gold and silver. So give us a call at 1-800-375-4188. That's 1-800-375-4188. And make sure you visit our website at dgscoins.com, dgscoins.com. You can sign up for a weekly newsletter. We were a little late this week. It actually went out this morning. So go ahead and sign up. It usually comes out on Mondays. And um, um, I, I don't know if you saw, but I, I, the article I sent you was I'd, I'd gotten a little spoof that was talking about the Bitcoin, and it was called Monkey Business, and I thought maybe you would get a big kick out of that. We do have a caller. We have Neil from Missouri. Neil, how are you doing today? 
Oh, doing all right this morning. It's not that cold. It's still below freezing, but <laughs> yeah, it is. Better than it has been. <laughs> you know, it is snow January. Going. Yeah, 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 that's true. But uh, I was calling about this inflation thing. You know, one of the ways you can beat inflation is to invest in food, and you do that by watching your sales on food, and you only buy the stuff that's on sale, and you stockpile it, and you take and use from the old stock as you buy the new stock. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that way your food doesn't get old on you. I mean, I see sales, you know, especially if you watch grocery stores that are close to a Walmart supercenter, they'll run special sales to undercut Walmart to get you coming in their store instead of going to Walmart. And Walmart prices are not a bargain anymore. I don't know if you've noticed this lately, but inflation has hit Walmart big time. A lot of their stuff is, is starting to really climb in Walmart. But uh, if you watch these grocery stores that are located near them, you'll find these special sales. Like, you can buy canned goods, you know, string beans, corn, peas, whatever, for uh, uh, sometimes tomatoes. $5 a case of 12, which is, you know, unheard of anymore. I mean, you used to be able, years ago, you'd buy them free for a buck. But, you know, yeah. I mean, I haven't seen that in, in five, six in years. I haven't seen anything like that. Yeah, so... But uh, for a case of canned goods for five bucks, and then you just start stockpiling that stuff, and uh, and then make your meals out of what you've stockpiled, and that way you can keep your food price down. I mean, I grew up in a big family. That's how my parents did it. Right. You know, they had a, a coal bin in the basement, and they just stockpiled food. You know, tuna was on sale. They'd buy twelve or as many as the store allowed you to buy at a time. Twenty four cans of tuna. Back then, of course, it was like ten, fifteen cents a can. Now you're lucky if you can get it for, you know, 59 cents a can. But uh, still, if you would do that, and, and a perfect example is the other day some, I went shopping with some people, and and uh, I got chicken, four bucks for 10 pounds. Okay, well, then they wanted to go stop by a, one of them drive throughs and they got them tacos for $14, tacos and sodas, junk food. They spent $14 on that when they could have bought 10 pounds of chicken for four bucks. Mm. So if people don't start waking up, you know, to what's going on with the with the food prices and the inflation in the food, they're going to be really hurting, you know, and if they're not already. And that's what I find with a lot of poor people, you know. They'll, they have dogs, but they can't afford to eat because they eat at restaurants and eat junk food instead of buying healthy food at the store when it's on sale and stockpiling it. So, and uh, the inflation well, a lot of that, they've not been taught you, to do that, you know. Yeah, I know. Have you noticed in your area, gasoline has jumped 40 cents a gallon in the last mm-hmm. month here yeah. in southwest Missouri. Went from a buck ninety nine to up to 240 now. And right. it's probably just going to keep climbing, even though apparently, you know, barrel of oil isn't, hasn't gone up any. But the, uh, the gasoline prices are going up. That's because the oil companies are already starting to pull the excess currency out of the economy. It's starting to come back into the country by... You know, these tax breaks encouraging corporations to come back and invest their money back in the United States. And all, all that's going to do is just drive inflation. So people really need to start looking at what they can do to, to try to, you know, inflation-proof themselves from what's coming and what's, well, what's going on already. It's already going on. So, and You know, years and years ago, I remember my mom and dad, They were we were still living in uh, Raytown in Kansas City area in, in Missouri, and I, I overheard parents talking about that uh, – the butcher there in the grocery store, um, you know, you could uh, you could order a quarter of beef or half a beef or something like that, and they were talking about that. And the butcher told him, he said, you know, you're better off to watch the sales and, and oh, yeah. buy it and put it in the yeah. freezer than you are to buy it in one lump. And uh, I don't know that that's true every time, but the butcher was telling him, you know, you're really better off to buy it when it's on sale and just stick it in the freezer and uh, use it as you can. And uh, uh, so... I thought that was interesting, right, that's, too. That's what I do, especially, you know, like stores will sell that chicken in those 10-pound bags. That's what I buy. If it's over $4 for a 10-pound bag, I don't buy it. I wait until it's on sale. Then I'll buy, you know, two, sometimes three bags, whatever I can stuff in the freezer, you know. Mm-hmm. 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 It's hard to buy good chicken in the grocery store anymore. I think it tastes nasty. <laughs> <That's just amazing. laughs> yeah, but, but it's uh, better than eating tacos. You know, from yeah, a restaurant yeah. <laughs> and soda pop, and drinking soda pop, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, we had very little of that when I was growing up. Uh, we had soda pop on 4th of July. Mm-hmm. 
That's right. Right. It was a treat. It wasn't a. It wasn't a staple like it is now with most families. That's a staple of their diet is soda pop. And you're right. When we were, when I was a kid, it was it was a treat. It wasn't a you know. It wasn't just grab one the refrigerator whenever you wanted one. You know. <laughs> Same thing with potato chips. Same thing with potato chips. That was oh, when yeah. we had potato yeah. chips. So yeah. All right. Appreciate it, Neil. Thank you for your wisdom. Appreciate yeah, you're it very welcome. much. <laughs> The one thing I wanted to mention is kind of a serious issue, and uh, that, of course, is the failing of the uh, Pain-Capable Unborn Child Protection Act. Uh, the Senate voted 41 to, I'm sorry, 51 to 46 in favor of the Pain-Capable Unborn Child Protection Act, which was short of the 60 votes required to proceed to a final vote under the current Senate rules. Um, Republican Senator um, Lisa Murkowski of Alaska and Susan Collins of Maine both voted against the bill, which uh, would have prohibited abortions of unborn babies after 20 weeks, the age at which they can feel pain, people believe. I believe they feel it before then, with exceptions uh, in cases of rape and incest and to save the mother's life. Well, if you've noticed, um, these two senators have voted against Republicans numerous times, and that's uh, Lisa Murkowski from Alaska and Susan Collins from Maine. But the pro-life advocacy group of Susan B. Anthony, they list uh, immediately announced that organization uh, would target four Democrat senators from Trump state who oppose the ban and are up for re-election uh, in 2020. It's Jared Brown of Ohio, Claire McCaskill of Missouri, and she needs to be worried. And North Dakota's uh, Heidi Heitkamp and Montana's John uh, Tester. Well, if they're going to go after the Republicans, they need to go after, I mean the Democrats, they need to go after the Republicans who did the same thing. And I know they're all about having a balance, and I'm seeing that it really doesn't do us any good, does it, when, it, when the Stuff hits the fan that's serious. They always manage to vote Democrat and against life. I hear the music free. Melody, it's been a pleasure to be here with you It's been you a today. pleasure. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much for uh, today. And tomorrow we will be back. And tomorrow, Melody and Beth Ann. Uh, Melanie's not all of her so up for it, but we're going to talk about what the president says tonight. And we will see you tomorrow. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built, that's CrossTheBorder.org. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ.
This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. 